this week's Investing Mastermind podcast, Michelle and I dive deeper into the conversation with Charlotte Janis, creator and writer of the blog BeyondBenGraham.com. Charlotte's legendary grandfather, Benjamin Graham, left a lasting mark in the world of investing with his value investing theory, but her blog is dedicated to the personal and lesser known aspects of Graham's life. If you missed the first part of this captivating interview, we released it last week. I highly recommend going back one episode and give it a listen. Today's episode is a reminder to us about the legacy we leave behind. It's how Graham created a movement, starting with Warren Buffett, that values not just the wealth we accumulate, but the impact, the kindness and wisdom we pass on. And this is where we start out today, by talking about Ben Graham's generous spirit. Here's Charlotte. Mr. Buffett enthused about my grandfather's generosity as a teacher. Ben Graham was his finance professor at Columbia Business School, and Warren was a young graduate student in his early 20s, but other students in the class were investment professionals. They had jobs on Wall Street. They attended class to learn security analysis and value investing, and one of the rewards for them of the class was that Ben Graham would use examples in his lectures of actual companies and stocks that he thought were of great value. So they would bring those gems back to their places of work. And when Warren Buffett talked about this, his eyes just sparkled. He he said, my grandfather freely gave stock tips to everyone in the class, including all the students who worked at competing firms. He didn't think about competition or, you know, he just gave. And I love this quote from Buffett that he wrote in the Financial Analyst's Journal in 1976, right after my grandfather died. He wrote, his third imperative, generosity, was where he succeeded beyond all others. I knew Ben as my teacher, my employer, and my friend in each relationship, just as with all his students, employees, and friends. There was an absolutely open-ended, no scores kept generosity of ideas, time, and spirit. And I wanted to add that one other way that Ben Graham was generous was that he didn't just invent security analysis and value investing. He wanted to share it with others. And he did so not just by teaching at Columbia Business School and later at UCLA, but he wrote books about them, The Intelligent Investor and The Big Tome, Security Analysis, which is still a Wall Street Bible. And so he shared them with present and future investors. In addition to Warren Buffett and how he impacted some of the students around him, how did his kindness impact the people around him, both personally and professionally? Mr. Buffett told me that when he first went to work for Ben Graham, he was a new employee. He was 24 years old. And he said, I said, how did he treat you? And he said, he treated me kindly, just like he treated all the other employees in the office. But here's an example that really touches me. In the crash of 29 and the subsequent market losses, Ben Graham's hedge fund dropped 70%. It was huge losses. And when I checked in with Mr. Buffett about what I'd read, he confirmed that after that, I think it was five years, Ben Graham worked for nothing. He worked for nothing because he wanted to repay all the losses of his investors. His investors, who he called old personal friends and comrades in misfortune, they weren't wealthy like the people you think of now who are hedge fund investors. They were regular people, relatives, friends, people who depended on him to keep their nest egg safe. And he'd failed. He'd failed to keep it safe. And he worked for five years to rebuild his investors' equity in the fund without taking a penny in pay. So he had a wife and four children and a widowed mother that he had to support through teaching and consulting. And it wasn't until December of 1935 did he finally, what he called, make good on all of his investors' losses and resume paying himself a percentage of the fund's profits. And I don't know if other fund managers did this in the 30s, work for, for free for five years managing a fund. But it strikes me as very, very generous. What life lessons did he impart that have influenced your own values? One life lesson is that accumulating wealth and possessions didn't protect him from setbacks and tragedies. 
My grandfather had three failed marriages. He suffered the loss of four loved ones to untimely deaths. It's really sad, you know, when I see that. And I think it in, inspired me or influenced me to not choose a career path that might have made me rich. You know, I originally chose to be a registered nurse and nurse practitioner and health educator. And I think in part, it was when I knew him well, and he was a real example for me in my teens and early 20s, he was really happy with having enough. He'd stopped staying in swanky hotels. He lived in two small homes. There was nothing fancy about them. And he exuded contentment. He seemed to feel good inside. And I wanted to feel good inside too. And I think it really influenced me and my values. Your grandfather came up with the core principles of value investing, which is the investing strategy that we describe on this podcast. His investment philosophy has been influential for decades and continue to inspire new investors. When did he first become interested in investing? And do you know what sparked that interest? My grandfather's primary goal when he graduated from Columbia was to support himself and his mother and his brothers. He was 20 years old and a dean at Columbia recommended him for a job on Wall Street and he took it. The pay was $12 a week, but he figured he had a chance to make more in the future And he had in his mind that he had to make $50 a week before he could marry my grandmother, Hazel. And so he got interested in investing because he worked in an investment firm and that was the challenge before him. And he had a brilliant, far-ranging mind and he just, he applied his brilliant mind to the task at hand. And he had learned how to shop for good deals as a boy. He had worked after school jobs all through his school years, giving almost all his earnings to his mother to go toward the family food budget. But one time he saved enough to buy himself a $1 tennis racket. And you can see a photo of, of a similar racket, the Spalding favorite tennis racket in my blog post that's titled with a little help from Ben on beyondbengram.com. So he bought used tennis balls for a bargain price of three for 25 cents. Many, many children and adults shop for bargains and always have, but only Ben Graham had the idea of applying that principle to stocks. And he bought tennis balls for less than they were worth. And he invented value investing and entails buying stocks for less than they're worth. I think it was really the circumstances he found himself in that he really applied himself and let his creativity as well as his intelligence. And why do you think it was so important to your grandfather to not lose money to have an investing style so focused on risk avoidance? Well, when he was a boy and his mother was struggling just to feed and clothe and shelter her three sons, he was the youngest of three. She had, I think what her savings of $5,000 might've been from life insurance from his father when he died, when Ben was eight. And she invested her life savings with a broker friend. And they thought that those $5,000 were invested in U.S. Steel. And when Ben was a small boy, he'd open the financial page every morning and see what U.S. Steel had done. And he was happy when the price went up and he was sorry when it was down and he would call out to his mother what it was that day. The situation was that they, Dorothy, his mother, Dorothy and Ben didn't know that their broker friend and his son were running a crooked bucket shop. And it was a common scam in those days where they would take the money, they would pretend they had invested it in the name of that client, but in fact, they put it in their own bucket. And then they pretended to purchase stock in the client's name. And then when there was an inevitable market downturn, in this case, it was the panic of, I think it was 1907, when the price of U.S. Steel went down, they would tell the client that you've lost all the money. And this is what happened. They said... She lost all her money in the panic and they just took her $5,000. It was gone and she needed that money. And I think that he wanted to be the kind of fund manager, investment advisor, and investor that his mother had needed and that all the people like her all over um, the world needed to be to keep somebody's money safe and to avoid risk. And so he became that manager. And as it turned out, 
that scam, that bucket shop scam um, kept going until the 20s. And then finally, there was some prosecution. And actually, the son of that friend went to jail. But Ben became the smart and honest and safe fund manager that his mother had needed and that he'd wanted when he was a boy. That's really some fantastic reflections on how that came about. So thank you so much for sharing. One of the other key principles of value investing is investing with a margin of safety to buy stocks when they are cheap. Where do you think that came from? The margin of safety principle guides investors to choose stocks that they can buy at a price significantly below their intrinsic value. Ben Graham invented a formula for calculating intrinsic value. The margin of safety would be the difference between what the stock is selling for on the market and the intrinsic value as calculated by his formula. The larger the margin of safety, the greater the cushion that protects the investor from loss. And that was really one of his main principles was using that to protect investors from loss. He just utilized that idea, I think, from his experience as a boy trying to buy bargains, things that were worth, I think he was actually the food shopper for the family. His mother was really good at delegating chores to her three sons, which I admire her for, because I know it's hard to get to get kids to do any chore around the house, but she had them do a tremendous amount of chores. And um, Ben was designated to do the grocery shopping and I think he really got experience, like he had a limited amount of change in his pocket and he had to buy enough liver for dinner and onions and, you know, potatoes. And he would figure out the ones that had value, but were lower priced. And again, he he applied that principle as an adult when he worked in the stock market. And I do write about this aspect of his boyhood in in a blog post called With a Little Help from Ben. And I'm struck with how elegantly the margin of safety reflects his lessons of fiscal caution that he learned as a boy growing up in a situation where his family, his mother was always short of money. And that's a highly relatable experience that we learn so many money life lessons through our family upbringing. And it, it's incredible how that carried into his inventing the principles of value investing. And we know that Ben Graham closed his fund in 1956 and never returned to his life as a money manager. Why do you think he left this path? And was there a specific turning point? Yes. In 1954, he suffered a family tragedy and this blow hit him very hard. I think it had become never before as clear as it was then that amassing wealth for its own sake had limitations. It, it couldn't protect him and his family from, from tragedy. And he didn't write about his inner life and in how he processed this loss. But when I look at the subsequent actions, the big changes he made in his life, it's clear that the shock waves triggered deep introspection. And I think he questioned everything about his life, including his values. And he asked himself, what really matters to me? And how do I want to spend the rest of my life? So two years later, in 1956, he closed his Wall Street office. And that was the end of a stint as Warren Buffett's boss. And he had, in 1956, it was the end of a legendary run that put him on the list of Forbes' top all-time fund managers. It was a 20-year period, which he managed a fund with his partner, Jerome Newman, and it earned an estimated return of 21% annually, which just kind of boggles the mind. So he retired from investing at the peak of his powers. He said, and I quote in my section about Ben Glam, he said when he started out, he believed the mark of success lay in large earning and large spending. And in 1956, he changed his mind and he really lived a life from then on of little earning and less spending, a very simple life. And you can read more about this on beyondbengram.com under the heading about Ben Graham, the change he made at that time. What defined the chapter of your grandfather's life following his investing career? He moved from New York to California. He taught finance at UCLA for no pay. And he began to write autobiographical vignettes, including his, quote, self-portrait at 63, which is published in the memoirs. And 
in that self-portrait, which is astonishing to me, he recognized that he'd suffered emotional wounding as a boy and that he built what he called a breastwork, which is kind of an old fashioned word for a barricade or a defensive wall around his heart to protect himself. I think it's amazing that he figured this out about himself without the help of a therapist or, you know, at that time, psychoanalysis was quite available. He didn't partake of that. And he also didn't have the collective cultural familiarity we have now with emotional healing and growth that's well understood today in a way it wasn't then. But he he saw this himself and seeing his wounds, he made it a priority to try to heal his heart and dismantle that wall and open his heart to be able to love and, and connect more with people and have a stable, affectionate relationship with a woman for the last two decades of his life and to warmly welcome family members like me for visits. He found fulfillment far from Wall Street. He lived simply Money was not the center of his life. Investing was a sort of distant sideline, and he was free to follow his passions. He wrote his memoirs. He read literature and poetry. He translated. He'd have his cat, Minet, on the table, who would be batting at his pen while he, he wrote everything longhand, and he translated the Iliad from the Greek. I remember reading about some of that on your blog, in addition to <laughs> reading about your meeting with Warren Buffett in Omaha. So I want to ask, can you walk us through what it was like the moment you first met Warren Buffett? How was it considering the history between Buffett and your grandfather? Mr. Buffett invited me to Omaha with my husband to go through 60 years worth of Van Graham papers that he'd collected and kept in files at Berkshire Hathaway. My job was to select papers of historic value to donate to an archive of Benjamin Graham papers at Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library. So the very first day, Mr. Buffett's secretary, Debbie, greeted us and she showed us to a conference room that had a panoramic view. And this was to be our office for the next three days of work. And nine big folders of, they were these pale green folders of letters and papers awaited us on a spacious wooden table. And you can see a photo of those photos if you want in my blog about this visit with Mr. Buffett. Soon after we opened the first folder, Mr. Buffett strode in with his investment manager, Ted Weschler, and he introduced us and he right away just started talking animatedly about my grandfather. And he launched into this anecdote about when he worked with my grandpa, Ben, and they would go to lunch together. And he said, Ben would tell me, don't worry too much about making money. It will change how your wife lives, but not how you live. And he just laughed gleefully at the memory. And he said, my grandpa, Ben said, you will still wear the same clothes and eat at the same cafeteria. So relax. And so they off they went to this cafeteria, you know, to have lunch together. Mr. Buffett himself was relaxed. He was friendly. I thought I'd be nervous, but he instantly put my husband and I at ease. His eyes twinkled. He has blue eyes and they twinkled when he remembered something amusing. It was a great pleasure and very meaningful to me, a privilege to have the chance to talk with a man as eminent as Mr. Buffett, but because he knew my grandfather well. There's so few people alive that really knew my grandfather. And it was an honor and very moving to me to witness Mr. Buffett express his admiration and affection for my grandfather and, and to see it in his eyes and, and hear it in the emotion in his voice. It was just an unforgettable experience. Mr. Buffett started out telling me that he'd read all the investment books in his father's office when he was a boy. But when he read Ben Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, at age 19, he was a college student uh, at Lincoln, Nebraska, it changed his life. Ben's book drew him to Columbia Business School because he wanted Ben Graham to be his professor. He wanted to study economics and finance at Columbia with Ben Graham and, and Ben Graham's fellow professor. David Dodd. Mr. Buffett completed his graduate degree and he offered to work for my grandfather for free. My grandfather said no. And Warren Buffett went back to Omaha 
But then in 1954, Ben Graham changed his mind and offered him a position in his very small Wall Street office where he managed a fund. And right away, Warren had, Warren was married to his wife, Susie, and, and they just uprooted from Omaha and moved to New York so Mr. Buffett could work under his dream boss with his mentor. And they not only had one baby, but uh, Susie Buffett was pregnant with their second child. And Ben Graham became Warren Buffett's hero, not just as an investment innovator, but as a brilliant thinker and a kind and generous human being. Warren Buffett doesn't just practice Ben Graham's investment principles to this day. He has embodied Ben Graham's friendliness and his kindness and generosity too. Well, that brings us to another question of, did anything about Mr. Buffett's office or work environment remind you of your grandfather? Well, let's see. Mr. Buffett's desk was more cluttered, uh, but he's working. And when my grandfather was retired, he had some clutter on his office, including his cat on his on his desk and an open newspaper and flowers. But I would say both Mr. Buffett and my grandfather wore sweaters and no tie, and they both seemed at ease. And there was a friendliness, a familiar friendliness and welcoming smiles and just the energy of the people around Warren Buffett reminded me of how people felt in my grandfather's presence. People seemed unstressed. They seemed remarkably relaxed for being at work. Even his, his investment manager, Ted Weschler, who flies to Omaha each week for a few days to work with Mr. Buffett, seemed happy and at ease. One day he saw my, uh, my husband and I pass this open door and he just invited us in for, for a far-ranging conversation. I think in terms of my favorite items or mementos that were in the office, the second day we were there, Mr. Buffett led us down the hall to show me the photographs of his of my grandfather in his office. And he has framed photos on this wooden credenza displayed around his desk. And he picked up the portrait of my grandfather and he held it in front of him, Warren Buffett did, and he was standing right below a larger portrait of Mr. Buffett's father. And he told me that they were the two most influential people in his life. And he let me take a photo of him holding that portrait of my grandfather. And it's the same portrait that I have that I got at my grandfather's 80th birthday party. So I'd say that that's my most moving memento that most, both Mr. Buffett and I share. And that was very familiar. That concludes today's episode with Charlotte Janis, the granddaughter of legendary investor Benjamin Graham. We'll be back next Tuesday with the continuation of our exciting conversation with Charlotte. If you enjoyed the show and found the content informational, we would be super grateful if you would leave us a review and follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you automatically get new episodes in your feed. We publish a new show every Tuesday. The contents of the Investing Mastermind podcast are for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. None of this is investing advice. And if you need help in your personal situation, please consult with a professional.